Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 51, Apollo 17, Part 2, Final Footprints. Last time, we began our coverage of Apollo 17. We learned about the crew, including the only scientist who would fly to the moon, as well as one of the few men who had been there before. We learned about the wrangling required by NASA managers to choose the crew, NASA managers who had been forced to make the difficult call to cancel the remaining lunar flights in the face of budgetary realities. We learned about the intriguing and challenging landing site at Taurus Littrow, which offered one last chance to answer so many questions. And after all that, we sat back and witnessed with our imaginations the spectacle that was the one and only Saturn V night launch. The sun rose early on Florida that night, even as the sun set on our first small steps beyond our home world. All right, maybe that's a little bit much, but it's the end of the moon program, and I reserve the right to get a little emotional, all right? Today, we'll button up the hatch, hook into the harnesses, fire up the dips, and watch for that blue contact light one last time. Despite my hamming it up a bit, as we zoom out to lunar orbit to meet our crew this fine December in 1972, we find them nice and relaxed. The trip out to the moon was largely uneventful, and the trusty service propulsion system had done its job without complaint, inserting them into lunar orbit. It was time to head to the surface. Getting ahead of myself a little, the Apollo 17 landing encountered no notable issues. But I think that in itself is pretty notable, especially as you take a look back at all the previous lunar modules. When the crew opened up Lunar Module Challenger for inspection during translunar flight, they found a few floating washers, a phenomenon that had occurred ever since the first LEM flight on Apollo 9, but everything was in good working order. Thanks to the uneventful leg out, they weren't forced to once again call upon the LEM to serve as a lifeboat, as it so admirably did on Apollo 13. There were no undocking issues or shattered display covers like the minor problems Apollo 15 encountered on the first flight of the upgraded J-Mission lunar module. While Ron Evans piloted CSM America away to recircularize its orbit, Challenger didn't encounter any sudden and unexpected barrel rolls like it did on Apollo 10. The attitude control system was stable and predictable. Time for powered descent to begin. As usual, the descent began gradually with the RCS attitude control thrusters activating so that the propellant tanks could settle. Then the dips engine ignited, starting at only 10% thrust. The computer noted the reaction of the vehicle to the thrust and gimbaled the engine back and forth until it was aligned perfectly with the spacecraft's center of mass. Only then did it throttle up to really get the descent underway. Flying on their backs in Program 63, the descent continued with no issues. The crew wasn't forced to respond to erroneous abort commands or a landing radar that refused to lock onto the surface, like happened on Apollo 14. And the computer didn't overexert itself, dropping programs off the bottom of the priority queue and triggering the 1202 program alarm Apollo 11 was forced to confront. As the spacecraft entered program 64 and pitched forward for the approach phase, the view out the window was exactly what was expected and matched closely with what the simulation showed. The crew benefited from approaching during the planned lighting conditions, unlike Apollo 16, which remained in orbit for an additional six hours, resulting in subtle but important changes in the sun's angle upon landing. At 300 feet, Gene Cernan took over manual control of the LEM, entering Program 66, and prepared to make good on the landing he wished he could have performed three years earlier. During the final descent, the view out the window showed some dust, but unlike the total gray out of Apollo 12, the ground remained visible. One by one, Challenger flew past the notable issues that previous crews had to deal with, executing a flawless powered descent and landing. On December 11th, 1972, at 7.54 p.m. Universal Time, Challenger's contact probes struck the surface, the engine was cut, and the spacecraft settled onto the surface, only about 600 feet from its target. Cernan, perhaps purposely playing with the ambiguous name of his command module, called out, Houston, you can tell America that Challenger is at Taurus Littrow. Four hours later, it was time to get to work. Cernan descended the front ladder and stepped down onto the LEM footpad. He radioed to Houston, I'm on the footpad, and Houston, as I step off at the surface of Taurus Littrow, 
I'd like to dedicate the first step of Apollo 17 to all those who made it possible. He then stepped onto the surface and continued, Jack, I'm out here. Oh my golly. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, but is it bright in the sun. Not far behind him was Jack Schmidt, eager to become the first geologist to explore another world in person. His first words on the surface? Hey, who's been tracking up my lunar surface? In one of many minor moments of ceremony on this final flight, the crew erected a sixth American flag in the lunar regolith. This particular flag had special significance, as it had hung in the Houston Mission Control Room ever since Apollo 11. And now, here it was. First on the agenda was to get the LRV, aka Lunar Rover, aka Super Cool Car on the Moon, unfolded and working, and then set up another iteration of the ALSEP experiments. There were some new experiments, but I think the first one that deserves our attention is an old The Space Above Us favorite. It's the heat flow experiment. As you'll recall, this obviously cursed experiment was first supposed to fly on Apollo 13, so that didn't work out. To be honest, I'm not really sure why it didn't fly on Apollo 14, but again, probably because it was cursed. On Apollo 15, it worked, but only limited data was collected due to the surprising difficulty of drilling boreholes for it. On Apollo 16, the drilling posed no problems, but whoops, John Young tripped on the data cable and the experiment was unable to be operated. This time, the cable was modified to prevent a similar incident. The holes were drilled, the sensors were placed, and at long last, this experiment had its time to shine. <laughs> Although, it occurs to me as I write this that I actually have no idea how it turned out. Which is maybe a little anticlimactic, but also isn't all that surprising. Science takes a long time to do right, so I would bet that the results were only published long after the mission reports I usually rely on as sources. In fact, when it comes to science, it almost made sense for the lunar operations to be suspended at this point, or at least take a little break. Apollo missions were returning such a wealth of raw data that scientists were unable to keep up. That also meant that it was difficult to tweak existing experiments or design new ones in response to the returned data. By the time you analyzed something from Apollo 11 and had a new experiment ready to fly, the whole program might already be over. Anyway, while I don't really have a good follow-up on the heat flow experiment, I think we can all just be happy for the poor scientist who toiled over it for all those years. New to the ALSEP was a gravimeter, which was designed to detect small changes in the local gravitational field. The hope was that this would finally confirm a prediction of Albert Einstein's and detect gravitational waves. The moon was seen as a perfect location for this, since it got away from all the noise and vibration caused by all that pesky life on Earth. The ALSEP gravimeter was also joined by the Traverse gravimeter, which traveled with the lunar rover. The crew would make readings at various locations around the valley that could be checked against the readings back at the ALSEP experiment. In addition to gravitational waves, the measurements would also further refine our understanding of the lumpy gravity field of the moon. Of course, with hindsight, we know that gravitational waves weren't actually detected until 2016 in the LIGO Observatory right here on Earth. Take that, moon! Once the ALSEP experiments were deployed, it was time to go a roving. Unfortunately, the trail would be a little dustier than usual, since in the process of setting up the LRV, Cernan accidentally tore off the rear fender. That might just sound like a minor inconvenience, but you can kick up one heck of a rooster tail with no air and only one-sixth gravity. And that dust will land all over the astronauts and their equipment. And that's actually a pretty big deal. I touched on this a little in the second Apollo 12 episode, but lunar dust is probably one of the biggest challenges to long-term missions to the moon. The problem is it just gets into everything, including stuff like airtight seals or joints of spacesuits. The joints become stiff and difficult to work. Seals start leaking or just won't connect properly at all. It's also not great for the humans inside the suits. Dust on Earth is pretty tame since it's blown all over the place by the wind, so has eroded away all of its rough edges. Plus, since it's in an atmosphere with oxygen, the exterior is covered in a thin layer of oxidized material. Lunar dust isn't like that. It's all jagged and raw. And since it hasn't oxidized yet, it's chemically active. That's not great for stuff like lungs or eyes. 
If you're just going for a few days, you can manage it, but if you want to stay for a month or a year, it's going to be a serious problem that someone will have to address. But for now, the Apollo 17 crew is just going to have to deal with this nasty dust raining all over them. Setting off about 5 hours into the EVA, this first drive in the LRV wasn't too far since their destination was a crater less than a mile away. They took a few samples, recorded readings from the Traverse Gravimeter, and set up some experiments. Then it was time to head back. One thing Harrison Schmidt mentioned as a severe challenge was the time pressure of spaceflight. In earthbound geology, you might spend months or even years in a particular area, carefully examining all aspects of your subject of interest. But in space, there's simply no time. The life support backpacks can only support you for so long, and orbital mechanics will not delay for you when it's time to come home. So for him, there was a real struggle between his scientist mind and his astronaut mind while on the surface. Part of how he made up for the crush of time was to make a lot of observations out loud when possible. For example, when Cernan was driving the LRV, Schmidt would examine his surroundings and just think out loud with his geological impressions. That way, researchers, including himself, could cross-reference it with the hard data returned by the flight. Seven hours and just shy of 12 minutes after the EVA began, Challenger's hatch was sealed and the first of three EVAs was complete. As the crew settled in for their rest period, someone joked over the radio that, quote, Well, the moon's weather is fair and sunny. It's only scattered clouds, and all of them seem to be attached to the Earth. Couple of comedians up there. The next morning, if you can call it that, the crew suited up for a long day. Actually, the longest of days, since, spoiler alert, this will be the longest lunar EVA of the entire program. Once Cernan and Schmidt got outside, the first order of business was to fix the rear fender of the moon buggy. While the crew slept, folks on the ground, including Apollo 16 Commander John Young, helped come up with a solution. Simply duct tape together some unneeded maps, and use some clamps to attach them above the rear wheel. And there you go, one LRV fender. Duct tape, what can't it fix? And I'm sure the crew were glad to have that new fender in place, because they were going to be putting a lot of driving in today. In fact, at 12 and a half miles, it would be the most mileage ever put on the lunar rover in one day. Cernan and Schmidt would also travel farther from the LEM than any other crew, nearly five miles. The distant destination was a small crater at the foot of the South Massif named Nansen. I don't know about you, but when I visualize the lunar surface, I have a tendency to think of the Sea of Tranquility from the Apollo 11 days. This drive was not that. These massifs were, well, I'm sorry, massive. They were like two miles tall, so they really loomed over the astronauts as they approached Nansen. Over an hour after setting off in their moon buggy, the crew arrived and got to work. But that incessant time pressure never lets up, so it wasn't long before it was time to move on. The crew made one of the toughest calls any of the surface crews had to make. Do you stay where you found something interesting and take time away from other destinations later in the EVA? Or do you leave now to ensure time at those potentially even more interesting sites? In this case, the crew bought themselves 10 more minutes by taking it from their stop at Shorty Crater planned for later in the day. When they finally did leave Nansen Crater, they swung by the small Lara Crater and then made a brief stop on top of what appeared to be a landslide from orbital photos. To save a little time, Schmidt didn't even get out of his seat and just reached out with a tool to scoop up some of the landslide. Their next destination was Shorty Crater, where their visit would now be truncated a bit. The crater was intriguing since it had dark soil surrounding it, which could indicate volcanic activity. When they arrived, Schmidt looked down and noticed that by kicking up some regolith, he had exposed orange soil. This got both men pretty excited, since if it was what Schmidt thought it was, then it would be the discovery of the trip. Schmidt's thought was that the orange soil was caused by volcanic gases venting from underneath the surface. These gases would include some oxygen, which would oxidize compounds in the lunar soil, leading to the orange color. Basically the same reason Mars is orange. The crew quickly got to work collecting samples, digging trenches, and taking cores. Once they started digging, they also found dark black dirt. What was going on here? 
The crew would have loved to spend more time at Shorty Crater exploring this orange and black dirt, but they had spent their extra time at Nansen Crater earlier. This is what makes a call like this so difficult. But oxygen tanks can't be reasoned with, so the crew gathered what they could and moved on. They couldn't know it at the time, but the unusually colored regolith was actually not from oxidation. Instead, it was from something called a fire fountain. When pressurized lava full of volatile gases gets too close to the surface, it would blast out into the lunar vacuum. The sudden expulsion, along with the embedded gases, caused the lava to spread out as it sailed over the landscape, becoming a cloud of small droplets. These droplets cooled into tiny glass beads. Each bead had a slightly different chemical composition, some with titanium, some with iron, stuff like that. The chemical makeups of the beads determine their color. The darker beads seem to be the source of the unusually dark surface in this region. The fire fountains also seem to explain these strange green beads that had been found in some craters on Apollo 15. So once again, the geology was not telling them the story they expected, but it was still fascinating. As I mentioned before, this EVA turned out to be the longest moonwalk of the entire Apollo program. And after 7 hours and 37 minutes, I'm sure that the weary crew was glad to be back in the LEM, where they could rest up. One thing that's easy to forget about these spacewalks is just how much effort they take. Yeah, it's only 1 6 G, but every movement is resisted by the bulky spacesuit. Trenches don't dig themselves, and core tubes don't penetrate the lunar surface on their own. It took some real grit to be out there all day with no breaks, no chances to eat, and the pressure of the whole world watching. After that welcome rest period, it was time for one last moonwalk. As Cernan inspected the lunar rover, he called down to Houston, Oh man, Houston, we've got a couple of dented tires. Capcom replied, What's a dented tire? A dented tire is a little golf ball sized or smaller indentation in the mesh. How does that sound to you? Sounds like a dented tire, that's how it sounds. <laughs> hey, it can't all be one small step. The main task on this last EVA was to hop into the LRV, explore North Massif, and then basically start packing up. The first destination at North Massif was a large boulder that had been spotted from orbit during Apollo 15. It was interesting because they could tell by the long trail it left that it had actually rolled quite a distance down the slope it was on. When they arrived, they found it was actually several large boulders, since the roll had caused the main boulder to break up. Schmidt got to work right away trying to gather all relevant data fast enough to save time later in the EVA. One thing that's striking about this mission, and really all the missions, was how much fun these guys managed to have. Cernan and Schmidt especially are a delight. Despite all of the fatigue, all of the hazards, all of the pressure, all of the lack of atmospheric pressure, they suddenly burst out singing. I was strolling on the moon one day, in the merry, merry month of... Then one says December, the actual month, and the other follows the lyrics and says May, and the whole thing falls apart. Undeterred, Schmidt skips off into the distance, humming to himself. If you've never seen it, you really owe it to yourself to hit up your video website of choice and search for Apollo 17 surface footage. It's hilarious. After only a few short hours, it was time to start wrapping it all up. They drove the LRV back near the LEM, and Cernan parked it far enough away to give the remote camera a good view of the upcoming ascent. The duo began collecting experiments that would be returning with them, as well as various rocks and samples. There was still a bit of ceremony left to perform. The crew unveiled a plaque on the Challenger descent stage, reading it out loud. It stated, Here, man completed his first explorations of the moon. December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. Schmidt got back on the ladder and climbed up to help pack away the samples. And with that, Gene Cernan found himself alone as the last human on the moon. He reflected on the moment by radioing down, As I take man's last steps from the surface, back home for some time to come, but we believe not too long into the future, I believe history will record that America's challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. And as we leave the moon at Taurus Littrow, we leave as we came, and, God willing, as we shall return, with peace and hope for all mankind. Godspeed, the crew of Apollo 17. He climbed up the ladder, closed the hatch, and that was it. 
somewhat anticlimactically, the next morning after their rest period, they opened the door again to toss out a bunch of stuff they wouldn't need anymore, calling out, Here you go, Santa Claus! A few hours later, with Houston watching on the Moon Buggy's TV camera, Cernan called out, 99 proceeded, giving the computer permission to launch, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Challenger's ascent stage sprang off the descent stage, sending a shower of golden flakes of insulation in all directions. Schmidt chimed in with, We're on our way, Houston! With no visible flame, Challenger rose straight up into the black sky, then pitched over and out of frame. It was gone. Rendezvous and docking were a breeze, with no major problems. Once all the rocks and equipment were transferred out of the LEM, it was sent on its way to be remotely steered into the lunar surface. I guess they were getting pretty good at that, because Challenger impacted just five and a half miles away from the descent stage. What's especially impressive to me about that is that's almost within the envelope explored by the astronauts. Safely back in lunar orbit, the crew settled in for two more days of observation and data collection. And then it was time for the moment of truth when it came to the SPS. If it didn't light, then there would be no way to get home. It had performed seven trans-Earth injections to date, but one failure would put a black stain on the entire program. But as usual, the dependable SPS did its job. When America emerged from behind the moon after 75 revolutions, it was right where it was expected to be. Apollo 17 was on its way home. The trip back was uneventful, with the usual mix of science experiments, TV interviews, and the highlight of the return trip, Ron Evans' brief EVA to retrieve film canisters from the service module Simbay. Fifteen minutes before entry interface, the service module was jettisoned, and the command module oriented itself to entry attitude. Entering at speeds that wouldn't be experienced by humans again for at least 48 years, Apollo 17 tore a path through the upper atmosphere. On December 19, 1972, 1.24 p.m. Houston time, America splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean. It was over. Next time. <laughs> well, what's next? Actually, despite all of my doom and gloom, there is a lot that's next. Yes, Apollo lunar operations are complete, and we will miss them dearly, but we're barely even getting started. Tune in next time as we take a quick look back at four of the most remarkable years in human history. We'll blast through a streamlined revisit of each flight and see how they all work together to achieve NASA's goals. And after that, we'll spend a little time on show notes. Several people have asked me where we go next, so I wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page. And since this will be a sort of retrospective episode, if anyone has any questions they'd like me to answer on the show, shoot me a message on Twitter, at SpaceAboveUs, or email jp at thespaceabove.us, and I'll see what I can do. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. <laughs> <laughs>